I got my Villanova gear on today, and for good reason. Chuck Everson is our guest, and Chuck won a national championship in 1985 with Villanova. I was a huge fan. My mom worked for the school, worked for the athletic department. I felt like I was along for the ride, and what a magical ride it was. And what a ride it was after that. Uh, Chuck takes us through his career, what it was like getting recruited by Raleigh Massimino, legendary basketball coach, what it was like playing for Coach Mass, uh, on and off the court, lessons learned. Uh, obviously, we talk about Gary McLean and what happened afterwards, uh, after the title, uh, what the Villanova family did to respond to that, and how fences were mended, and uh, just how a beautiful thing it is today, and what a beautiful thing that team did, and what they did for even somebody like me, teaching people they can do anything they put their mind to. Villanova, to me, was a great example of how you can overcome certain things in your life that you never think you can do. That David and Goliath approach uh, when they beat Georgetown in 1985 was just unbelievable. And Chuck was an intricate part of that team and is an intricate part of keeping them together. You know, the family, the Villanova family thing was a very, it was a very real, a very real thing. Uh, and, oh, yeah. and, and you could feel it. Now, you were a guy from Long Island, right, uh, from Brentwood High School. And yep. in 1982, I guess, you're, you, you were a freshman at Villanova, but you're getting recruited up until that point in time. You're getting recruited by Syracuse, Rutgers, other, other, other Big East schools. What makes you decide to go to Villanova University to play for Raleigh Massimino? Well, Raleigh Massimino <laughs> made me decide to go to Villanova. Uh, the story is I went to his basketball camp for years uh, when I was a kid. And when I saw him uh, speak and heard him speak, uh, I said to my dad one year, I came home, I think it was in the eighth grade. I came home and told my father, I want to play for that guy. Um, he said, well, you better get to work because they're pretty good. You know, so that's how that whole thing started. And when I was at the camp, I just found this out um, within the last six or eight months from uh, my coaches in high school. Uh, they had an extra help session at camp. So seven o'clock in the morning before anybody was up and at them, um, there was extra help sessions. And of course, back then, Pete, there was no cell phones to wake you up. So you had to constantly wake up to uh, to get out there but i never missed an extra help session and mitch bonaguro and coach mass would drive around in a golf cart and yeah. see me there every morning um sometimes i was there with one person sometimes i was there by myself sometimes there was 10 of us there but i was there every day and so they uh they woke my high school coach marty rigger up out of a sound sleep and said hey we want that guy how do we get a hold of that guy how do we get that guy so was that, that so you're waking up going to these optional sessions and they see kind of the fire in you and that makes yes. you probably even more attractive as a player at that point yeah. in time was the camp at the the, the Jake Nevin Fieldhouse because when I went no, it was oh no way before that it was up in the Poconos oh really uh, and, lo, and they had cabins there I mean it was a cool camp let me tell you something man the, the competition there was and incredible. it was the Raleigh Massimino basketball camp yeah, it was called East Coast Basketball Camp. Okay. Yep. I got to imagine uh, this is probably more competitive, that camp was, than the ones that I went to as a kid. Yeah, it was kind of like a five-star type thing, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I, I tell you what, they, you know, Lenny Bias was there, Raphael Addison was there, Andre Hawkins was there, uh, New Mike Brown was there. It was a, there was a bunch of guys that were just really, really good players. And I uh, one of the funny stories from the <laughs> camp, Pete, this is hilarious actually is uh you know so you had guys that were waiters like five star you know guys that maybe couldn't afford you know full payment or whatever so they had the waiters cabin so i go into the waiters cabin what exactly is a waiter in this okay, term so you had to get out early to go to breakfast or lunch or dinner because you had to set the table you had to bring out everybody's stuff you had you were a waiter you you cleared the table off. You 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 know made sure you helped clean up and set up for each meal, okay? And that's how you earned your scholarship to the camp, okay? So so I'm in the waiter's cabin, trading jersey, which is trading jerseys with a guy named Mike Brown, who went on to play with the Jazz and 
um, played played some other places. I think he was at George Washington. I'm not sure. And um, so we're going at it, and and this guy comes in, uh, comes walking up to the cabin with a shotgun, and apparently he thought one of the guys in the cabin was messing around with his wife. Okay. <laughs> and the guy had a legit shotgun and everybody hit the deck. They all dove under beds, myself included. And Coach Mass comes up and says to the guy, what are you doing? And he grabs the barrel of the shotgun and pushes it down. He goes, you're not shooting anybody at my camp. Relax. <laughs> you know? And he talked the guy down off the roof. But he was legit. He was legit going to shoot up the cabin. <laughs> what, so I mean, he just grabbed the thing and just said, oh, "You ain't doing that here." That's not <laughs> so, were you one of the waiters? No, okay, no, I was not. I, my, a lot of my friends were. All but, right, uh, I wasn't one. No. Who are some of the guys that you end up going to Villanova in 1982? Who are who are some of the guys in in your class? Uh, well, you were you were a class behind uh, Pinkney, McLean, McLean, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was it was Harold Presley. Wyatt Maker, R.C. Massimino, and Dwight Wilbur, myself. Okay. And where, where is Villanova? And the thing about that, which was crazy, was it was Wyatt Maker and I um, are pretty much the same player. I score better than Wyatt did, and he rebounded better than I did. But other than that, you know, he was on the West Coast. I was on the East Coast. That was pretty much the difference. Two you know? seven-footers. Yeah. So, so there's no emails. There's no nothing like that so uh what happens is they told me uh i say they paul comier was the guy that was recruiting wyatt and mitch bonagoro was recruiting me so they say to me one day hey uh we're not going to take both of us so whoever signs first that's who we're going to take the other guy i'm sorry you're out of luck we don't need two of you i said okay Put the contract down. I'll sign right now. They go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Cormier, Mitch is like, yeah, all right. That's great. And Cormier is going, oh, whoa, wait a minute. We got to call Wyatt Maker. I said, no, you don't. You said, whoever signs first, I'm telling you I'm going to sign it right now. Put it down. I'll sign it right now. So I was the first guy to commit. And then they go to Wyatt. <laughs> they went to Wyatt anyway. And he signs, uh, of course. And... Uh, it worked out great for the two of us because we're we're still best friends today. But the thing of it was, um, there was no uh, emails or any of that kind of stuff. So I was getting letters from Wyatt about, you know, do we are we going to room together? Do you want to get a fridge? Do you want, you know? So we wind up living together the first year, um, which was kind of a mistake because we're both competing for the same backup minutes to John and Eddie. With, with John the first guy you see when you go to sleep, the last guy you, you, you know, you know, the last guy you see when you go to sleep, the first guy you see when you wake up. Uh, we ate, slept, showered together, the whole everything, and it got to be too much, you know. So, on on a <laughs> on a drunken night in uh, in Sullivan Hall, somebody had uh, some sabers in their <laughs> room, and we started like sword fighting in the hallway, like for real, you know. Until somebody came up to us, some kid from Chaminade, I can't think of his name, but he uh, he took a lacrosse stick and beat the crap out of us with a lacrosse stick. <laughs> what are you guys doing? You guys going to kill each other, you know? So at that point, we decided maybe it'd be better if you moved next door. You know? <laughs> and the good thing, good thing we did because uh, – we're still like we're still great friends. We just went on vacation together in San Diego this year. That's unbelievable. Yeah. How yeah. many years we're talking about? What forty years now? Yeah. 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 Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Forty years coming up. I guess. Yeah. Thirty nine. Forty years. Now, what yeah. was the Big East like, and what was Villanova like? It was in nineteen eighty two, eighty three when you, your first season. It's just starting to percolate. I'm guessing. Yeah. It was just the Big East was still in its infancy. You know, so really nobody really knew um, how anything was going to play out back then. Now, now in Long Island as a senior in high school, are you seeing Big East games on television like once yes. a week, like on like USA Network and stuff? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yep. Len Berman was doing yeah. the games back then. And uh, Mike Gorman, uh, guys like that were doing the games back then. And uh, so you get to see the game. So you knew there was good competition. It was going to be a fantastic league. And it played into the. It played into everything about wanting to play in the East. You wanted your family to see you and your friends to see you play. Um, you knew we were going to be on TV a lot. 
which was also a big, huge deal. So, um, so yeah, so the Big East was kind of a big deal, and it was starting to become bigger and bigger. And then once we got in my our, my freshman year, truth be told, I don't think either Wyatt or myself was ready to get involved with real game time back then. I said a lot of times they, now they redshirt freshmen, and that would have been a good move um, had somebody suggested that to me <laughs> uh, back in the day because. Um, you know, you, you don't even real. you think you're a good player. You know, you're the best player on your high school team. And then you get there and you go, oh boy, John Pannon's really good. Yeah. You know, John Pannon was burly. He was like a grown man at, at, at 20 years old, yeah. you know? And so John, you're, uh, and John took no shit from nobody, Pete. I mean, he, <laughs> you know, he, if you didn't march his way, you didn't march. That was it. You were, you know, he was the captain along with Michael Mulquin and, uh, and Stu Granger and, those guys were tough, especially John and Mike. Those guys were really tough. So I attribute a lot of the success from that team to those two guys because of how they were great leaders. And how did Coach Massimino lead you guys? I mean, when your first your first impressions of this, you know, who would become legendary coach. At that time, he's a great coach. Uh, and obviously yeah. you wanted to play for him. But what were your first impressions of him? Any, anything that happened? Any stories like you're, you're welcome to Villanova or the Big East moment? Well, well, I thought he was crazy because, you know, he was he was a, a ball of energy, like a like an explosion of energy. Um, and that could be good or bad, depending on the day. If he was having a bad day, you know, look out if he was having a good day. All right. It could be a lot of fun, you know, but he was um, right till the day he passed away, a very emotional guy. Uh, his Italian heritage, I think, had a lot to do with that, Pete, you know. Um, fiery, fiery personality. The guy worked hard and played hard in life uh, and everything that he did. He did everything with enthusiasm. And, uh, you know, it was great. Even, you know, we laughed about some a lot of the stuff that happened when we were playing because the relationship with him was for the basketball part was about that much. You know, it wasn't very it was small more, amount. It, yeah, the, the lifelong relationship that I had with him um far far outweighed the basketball stuff and the basketball stuff was great obviously you know but he was um he was something else man and he you know and and you didn't cross him uh because if you did you were in trouble and if you didn't if you didn't follow the rules no matter if you were ed pinkney or Dwayne mcclain or you know steve pannone or chuck everson you know you know you you paid the piper if uh, if you messed up but the the great thing was about him with that was he allowed us to be kids. He allowed us to make mistakes. You paid for it uh, if you made a mistake, but he allowed you to do that. Like for, when a lot of teams, a lot of guys that I talked to from the Big East back then, they don't let, let you do that. If you look at the teams that Jay coached um, during the tournament in particular, you know, he wouldn't let those guys leave the hotel. Th those guys saw the hotel room, the locker room, the training room, the dining room, the film room and the basketball court. Yeah. That was it, you know? And we, this is, this is, like, a, this is like, at the okay, big East got... and, and, and in the NCAA. Yeah. Yeah. Cause well, coach mass would be, Hey, uh, we got film at five o'clock. God help you if you're late. And that so was Wayne it. And I, I, I played, I played with Ron Stewart, who was a St. John's guy. I played high school basketball with him. And Dwayne was good friends with Ronnie. And uh, so we went over to the St. John's hotel and hung out with those guys you know, the weekend of the 85 run, you know, yeah. like you, who would be able, you're not allowed to do that now, you know, and he took us to the, the horse farms, you know, we were there with, uh, next thing you know, we're petting Seattle slough and Ali Dar and a firm <laughs> and all these famous <laughs> world champion horses. This is in Kentucky. Yeah. In Kentucky, it was, it was unbelievable. You know, we, we, we got to do stuff. If we went to Florida, and we were anywhere near Disney World. He said, okay, here's passes to go to Disney World. Uh, make sure you're back by 7 or 8 or whatever the number was, you know. And, and you mentioned you back, Kentucky. Everything was fine if you weren't. That, yeah. That's your problem, you know. <laughs> you mentioned Kentucky. You guys go to the Final Four in Lexington. We'll get to that. But, you, you know, your first year, I, th I guess St. John's ends up winning – winning the Big East, but what, what is your impressions of playing in Madison Square Garden and the Big East tournament back then just uh, was, was unbelievable, and to be a part well, of that? It was electric, man. I, I mean, it's hard to describe, Pete, because uh, there was a buzz when you got into the city, you could feel it. You could feel the energy when you, when you got into the city, and then 
as you entered the garden, it was it was incredible. You know, first of all, as a kid I'm from Long Island, watching games, watching the Knicks, you know, in their championship seasons, and um, you know, and it, and at that time, you know, it was not that far removed from their championship teams with Clyde Frazier and Earl the Pearl and Willis and those guys, and uh, to play on the same court that they were playing on, it was a big deal, very exciting. Um, and then you get there, and it's unbelievable, and it's more than you would even imagine you know you get up that freight elevator and you're going holy cow i'm really here <laughs> and you get on the, you get on the court and you're like wow and and especially that final four weekend we were fortunate enough to get there a few times when i was playing and uh there's no better weekend like that's but back then it was the final four was like on a saturday and then they played the championship game on sunday and uh it was it was incredible. Usually it was us, St. John's, Syracuse, and Georgetown. You know. Yeah. And, what What uh, were some of those other coaches being being around those guys? I mean, we're talking about you know Hall of Famer legend. Of course, we talk about Coach Mass, but Jim Beheim, John Thompson, Lou Carnesecca. Yeah. What kind of aura did they bring uh, to, to the Big East in college well, basketball? They were rock stars, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, anytime something happened, the, the camera went to them. You know, every coach on every team seemed to be like a character and had his own was like a rock star you know and uh you know and you know to see coach mass jumping around on the sideline and louis on the sideline running around and Beheim, you know was whining at referees <laughs> and thompson's got the towel you know everybody was had their own thing and it you know it's funny it's the only conference that i could tell you i don't know of another one where all the fans knew the officials by first name <laughs> they were also stars you know so it's not like hey ref you stink it's hey higgins yeah hey, i was hey, thinking hey, yeah yeah uh -huh. hey froggy you stink yeah. hey you know hey larry larry lembo no, these other guys i mean it was it was really it was really cool uh, to play in that and there's a lot of um there's a lot of stuff you know when you when you get there and there's a lot of uh there's a lot of stuff that goes on uh that you don't even really know about you know what i mean it gets it, it's it's just crazy that whole from you know the b before the tournament started we'd have a luncheon every year so you get to a table and it's two guys from each team at the table and the georgetown guys have their heads down like this and if they look up to talk to you or communicate thompson puts his hand up and everybody's head goes down they were not allowed to speak to anybody you know and they had friends, you know, weren't allowed to do it. But it was cool because Dave Gavitt brought everybody together so that he did that on purpose so you get to know other guys that you that you played against. Let, let, so, let, some, so what that created, Pete, was if Georgetown was playing Virginia, remember the big game, Patrick against Ralph Sam? Yeah, yeah. We're around the TV in somebody's room, and we're screaming for Georgetown to win. And I tell people that, and I go, well, you're rooting for Josh? I go, yeah, I'm rooting for the Big East. Yeah. You know, because everybody was so loyal to the Big East. And, um, you know, you know, you see guys like from Carolina, and if Duke was playing, you know, Pittsburgh or something before they went to the Atlanta, uh, the ACC, um, they wouldn't be rooting for Duke for anything. Yeah, I, I experienced you know, they, that myself. They, they won't even shake hands on the on the on the end of game handshake line. I didn't realize how, as a fan, I was so died in the wool Big East until uh, Seton Hall made their run in '89, and I was so yeah. on board. I was like, "Wow, this is you know, I'm just pulling for Seton Hall every step of the way." I want to go backwards over the John Thompson thing because I think that's super interesting. Because now we get to know more about Georgetown and John Thompson, and we love them. And there's like really like, and those teams were so good. And, yep. but there was that like Hoya paranoia and, you know, John Thompson was not very trustworthy of the media uh, and, and maybe for good reason, but what, what, what the heck was that like? I mean, they were literally like, you know, he was like Darth Vader and they were like the stormtroopers to a, to a little kid, at least that's what it yeah, seemed like. Yeah. Well, and, that's kind of like how it was. Yeah. Uh, it was an us against them attitude that John had. And, uh, if you read his book, I came in as a shadow. It explains that you, it, it fully gives you a full understanding of why he said and did what he did. He was just trying to protect his guys the best way he knew how it was more of a tough love thing uh, for those guys. Not like coach mass where I'd get a hug after being screamed at all day. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, John was a tough guy and, uh, and he got the most out of his players. They played extremely hard and, uh, and they got after it. Nobody played harder than those guys and nobody, nobody was more aggressive than those guys. And, it, and if you weren't ready for that full court press, and that's why they dominated in the tournament so many times because these teams never saw them. We, we saw them two or three times a year, depending on if we played them in the big East. So we knew the press with Gene Smith on the top, you know, then you got, then you got Wingate and, uh, and Reggie, uh, you know, on the wings and Billy Martin. And then you got Patrick in the back erasing everybody's mistakes. It was like, you couldn't get through. It was unbelievable. <laughs> what was know? it like to and go toe to toe with Pat Ewing? You had to be at your absolute best just to hope to compete with him. That's how good he was. Cause he could run. He was very quick and he can jump out of the gym. Uh, and he was so athletic for a big guy. I think the way they used him in their offense, he could have scored a, a lot more points, but he sacrificed his own game for his teammates and, and, and for the greater good, you know, and that, that, that's an example, like today, a lot of people are not willing to do that, you know, but Patrick knew he was playing for something bigger than himself. And, you know, he was able to do that. If you look at the 84 championship game, and and I've spoke with Pat about this. Against you know. Houston. Yeah. You know, Mike Graham comes down and Tomahawk dunks on somebody. Pat is the first guy high-fiving him. He's jumping off the ground, high-fiving the guy, going crazy. And that's a superstar. I mean, that's, you know, you don't usually see that from your top guys, you know. And Pat was, you know, Pat was very supportive of his you know, of his teammates and uh, – that's why they were so successful. They were, you know, they played their asses off. I mean, they really did. Now, the thing of it is that's really funny is the Georgetown guys, since we've, you know, we've been doing this podcast thing. Yeah, the uh, we've Big got, East we've Rewind. Gotten to, we, we've gotten to meet a lot of these guys, and they're the, ni they're the <laughs> nicest guys in the whole league. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was shocked. And, you know, I do, I do a show with uh, Sonny Sparrow, as you know, and, Sonny played at Syracuse. For people who don't know, it's called Big East Rewind. It's easy yeah. to find, and it's a great, it's a great show. And and Sonny and I talk with these guys, and you go, "That guy's from Georgetown." <laughs> yeah, know? it was Pretty amazing, and, and you know the media did a great job of it too. I mean, they saw this narrative, and boy, they 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 ran with it. As a little oh, yeah. kid, I. I was terrified at Georgetown, but I certainly didn't like him. I certainly didn't like him either. And, of course, the impression, I, which is hilarious, is they might as well have been an HBCU as far as I was concerned. I had no idea that it was this, you know, liberal arts school in Washington, D.C. Um, and I thought that was always cool. They're, the education, all these guys played four years. They all graduated. Uh, and, and you watch them play, and it was almost like watching a well-oiled, like, Princeton team. They, they, the offenses they ran – uh, were just it was terribly efficient, and then you got guys who can jump out of the gym, and oh by the way, Reggie Williams could shoot from thirty feet. Right. You know, well, you you said something there that I don't want to let it go for a second. You know, those guys make no mistake. John Thompson took no stuff from nobody. Okay, <laughs> so those guys all went to class. You know, and uh, I know they got a bit of a, a rep um, back in the day, but those guys all went to class. I'm going to tell you something that I found out from talking with these guys and getting to know these guys. Mary Fenlon, who was that lady on the bench. Yeah, I remember. The yep. Was the academic advisor. They had to call her at 10 o'clock at night to check in, to let her know what was done in class that day, what they have due for homework the next day, what and they did it at 10 o'clock at night because they knew then that they weren't going out that they had to check in with her. So it was a double-edged sword. You got, you got, you know, they, they knew where you were. They knew you weren't at a party or hanging out somewhere. They knew if you're making a phone call to her at 10 o'clock. So you had to call her from 10 on. You couldn't call her before 10 o'clock. <laughs> and she was, the, she sat on the bench at every game. Yep. She was the academic advisor. And it was, the, you know, you guys had Jake Nevin on the bench. They had the, the, the academic advisor. It was just such a colorful time. Um, oh, yeah. You know, it was really cool. Now, as you guys start to progress as a team in 83, 84, let's say, are you, are you realizing you guys have the makings of a special group or are you just in, in the Big East, just, 
you know, be, beating the hell out of each other and other teams? Well, I, I don't think we really thought about how good we could be or what we are. I think we would just go in game by game and, and taking each challenge as it came on, um, especially uh, early. You know, I mean, uh, that that team, that my freshman year, I think that team probably man for man was better than the 85 team because John and Stu in particular were two uh, borderline or close to all Americans. Um, so, I mean, that team was really, really good. So we kind of knew we were pretty good, uh, you know, and, and it was our job as freshmen just to uh, work those guys as hard as we could in practice, that kind of thing. Um, and as we got into more different years, my second year, we were kind of, uh, kind of re- uh, kind of a rebuilding. 82, 83. Thing. Where'd you guys go uh, in the in the tournament? Where'd you do you remember? I'm uh, sure you do. We you... lost in the second round. We've never lost the first round game with Massimino. Okay. Wow. You know why? Because he was a genius at preparing for a team. So if if we got to the second round, we didn't lose that first game in the second round because he had three or four days to prepare. Huh. Anytime you gave him three or four days, it was a lock. We were winning the game, you know. Um, it's the one, the second half of that round, which could get hairy sometimes, you know? Yeah. He so was a genius at that. Th- the 84 team, so you say your, your first year, your freshman team was probably better than the 85 team, but the, but the 83, 84 team, uh, what, what do you remember f- f- from that group? Uh, well, I mean, listen, we, we played hard, we got after it, but we just didn't have enough. Uh, horses, you know, um, happy Dobbs was on that team. He was the senior leader on that team. Um, and Hap, Hap's a great guy. I'm still in touch with him today. Uh, you know, Presley was starting to come into his own a little bit, uh, as a sophomore. Um, I got a little more run, uh, my sophomore year versus my freshman year. Um, you know, and Dwayne, Gary, and Eddie was still trying to figure out if they were going to be leaders or how they were going to handle it, you know, as they went forward. So that's that's kind of why I brought that team up because, so now you said it's almost like a like a rebuilding year that that eighty three eighty four season, but the, the eighty five season starts and I I love like looking at the schedule and stuff. I think one game that jumps out at me. I think you guys are playing at the Palestra and you end up playing Temple. It's like one of those like two thirty afternoon games. It was on Prism, yeah. and uh, you know th- that ha- those Big Five games. You know, just as I see you get the big smile, almost as romantic as as, as the Big East memories. Uh, you, you're able to win a team, beat a beat team, a team like Temple, and it's almost like I look at the schedule. It's like, wow, I could see this team sort of turning the corner. That was a huge win, um, in in a ruckus atmosphere. What was that team like early on in the season? That '85 championship season. Um, you know, like you said, I, I, the, the issue, the 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 good and the bad of the Big Five is the good is. It, you're playing for bragging rights, and I don't think anybody really wanted the suburban team. We were the only team that yeah. was not in the city. I don't think they wanted the suburban team to win the thing, you know, to be honest with you. Uh, but there was nothing like doubleheaders at the Palestra, you know, on a Saturday. And you walk in and you can smell the popcorn when you walk in, the tiny locker rooms, the streamers, the signs, the atmosphere was like no other. Um, that, that said, it was also difficult because we got everybody's best effort. So uh, if we didn't win those games, we wound up on the bubble every year. And we weren't sure where we were going. Now, that season, if we're going to look at it, break it down, we lost 10 games that season. Five of them were to the number one or number two teams in the country. Georgetown or St. John's. John's. Yeah. Now, the Johnnies had our number. They beat us three times that year. Um, and, And Georgetown... My four years, it seemed we beat Georgetown at least one time uh, in each year. All right. So we kind of knew what they did and weren't afraid of those guys. But to say, but to come back, we lost, we lost the, a game that year to, uh, we played at the Cole Field House and Lenny Bias went crazy on us for like 36 or something. Um, he was, he was incredible to play against. I mean, just built like Superman. And was able to, you know, jump like Michael Jordan and 
you know, it was that athletic and everything. It was a real, real uh, tragedy what happened to Len. But uh, he killed us there at the field house. Um, and I, I can't remember. Uh, those were the those were the six of the ten losses. I don't remember the other ones so much. But you know, I know we. Well, oh, yeah, we lost to Pittsburgh. Was another one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you forget that one. Yeah. Um, and and we, when we get down to Pittsburgh. You know, Eddie and Dwayne and Gary were still trying to figure out, you know, do they want to be in the expansion crew or do they want to lead this team? And the expansion crew, that's what they called themselves, these three guys yeah, coming to campus. Year, they called themselves the expansion <laughs> crew, yeah. And we know Gary, you know, I've talked to Gary, you know Gary better than, yeah. you know, anybody. He, uh, you know, he liked to have fun. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit, but for sure. And Eddie mm-hmm. was just that million-dollar smile. And Dwayne, I mean, these three guys were, like, out of central casting. I mean, really, it was like, wow, these you yeah, right? I mean, it, yeah. yeah, I mean, they really were. So it, it made, it was, I can understand the temptations and all the other stuff. I remember seeing you guys once, and I always say this was, so those, you know, the Strids would have, like, parties. This is a Villanova family, Jerry Strid, and I remember that was the first time. And you may not remember this, but I do, because you guys were there. And uh, you guys would come in, it would be like maybe after, like, a football game or, or, or maybe a tailgate. You guys were all such great guys. I mean, all the way down to, to Gary McLean, you know, like everybody was just so nice and you were all so talkative, but some of those guys just radiated like energy, like Gary, you know, you could tell Gary was like, oh, oh this guy's special, you know, in yeah. whatever regard, but, but, you know, they weren't quite sure if they were going to lead. And now let's, we'll take it back to that Pittsburgh game. This is the last regular season game of this, uh, of the year. Like it's about time you got to shit or get off the pot here and you guys get your asses kicked on national TV on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, uh, and he benches the starters, right? I mean, and this Massimino yeah. does. What what is the what's the vibe like around that team going into the Big East and the NCAA tournament? Well, it wasn't pretty, as you know, Pete. I mean, um, as you say, first of all, Fitzgerald Fieldhouse is a bitch to play in. I mean, the the court it was a newer court back then, and the court was put down like right on top of the cement. But the wood floor was right on the cement, if you can understand what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. And it was no give. It was brutal on your knees. You, know, you had to run through their student section to get in and out of your locker room. So you got, you know, you got razzed by everybody. Um, but more importantly, we weren't ready to play. You know, we got in, we got in a game and they they took it to us early and often. And at halftime, coach rips off his tie and it's, you know, screaming about you got two minutes to play. If you don't play. I'm taking everybody out, which is was just a gutsy move because he knows how important it is for us to get a W because the magic number back then was you had to have 20 wins to get in the tournament, you know? And you guys were we on the bubble. Yeah, we were on the bubble, yeah. yeah. So we didn't, we didn't have 20 wins. So we needed to get this game, and nobody played uh, well, you know? So two minutes in, true to his word, uh, he yanked everybody, and he put the whole second team in. Now – the bad, the bad news for me was I wasn't on the starting team, but I was like sixth or seventh man. I was the first big guy in the game. And uh, I got lumped in with those guys, so I didn't get much time either way. <laughs> and it was the first time in the history of uh, the Chevrolet player of the game went to the Villanova second team. <laughs> so they, the, the whole second team got the Chevrolet player of the game. So, um, so that was a disaster. So... I think at that point, it's funny because um, I think at that point, Gary, Dwayne, and Eddie had a little discussion amongst themselves and said, hey, we're not going to go out like this. We can't do this. This is, we got to, we got to be remembered for something more than this. You know, we're on the bubble now. We're not going to, we might not get in. This isn't how it's going to go. And it, and that brought everybody together. Practices got a little more intense. Uh, guys were doing that, playing their roles the way they were supposed to. Like everybody was uh, playing hard all the time in practice and stuff like that. And um, those guys at that point decided that they were going to lead us to bigger things. I want to and, ask you about your, you know, you mentioned being that sixth or seventh guy in, the first big man in. What the hell is it like to to be just summoned off the bench in the, in the middle of a game and, and you're now thrown into – you know, air quotes, you're, you're, you're cold because you've been sitting on the bench and you're just yeah. thrown into the heat of battle. 
and and we need like yeah. five, six, seven great minutes out of you. How, how, how as a player? Well, it, I tell you, I tell you the exact mindset because I I've talked about this too. It's you know, usually I came in for Ed. Okay, so Ed Pink. My goal, my goal was I got two minutes to impress the little Italian guy. <laughs> So that when he puts Eddie back in, he puts him in for Presley. And so I now yeah. I would get four minutes. Then I got to keep impressing the Italian guy until they put Eddie in for Dwayne or, you know, or Presley in for Dwayne. So now I got a couple more minutes and then Dwayne would come and get me. So that was my goal. <laughs> that was a great day for me if that happened. That didn't happen as often as I would like, <laughs> you know, because you're looking over your shoulder, those guys – Again, you're coming in cold, and there's no excuses. You're coming in cold, and you're trying so hard to do the right thing by everybody that you overtry and you wind up working against yourself. That's the, yeah, that's my that's p- part of my question. I just can't imagine how you you, you, you channel all that, Pete. And so here's what happens: like Mass would tell me this more than one occasion. He goes, "You know, I put you in the game ever since, and you whack somebody. What do you? <laughs> every time you get in the game, you foul somebody. So I'm, I'm like." <laughs> I know because I, I, I'm tr- I'm just trying to be aggressive to to make a play. So if I made a play, if if that worked, instead of getting a foul, if I made a steal or got the ball, you know, oh, okay, leave Chuck in. You know, like okay, I'll give you an example of leave Chuck in. I'll give you an example. My sophomore year at the Spectrum, I go in for Ed, and I go right at Patrick. We're playing Georgetown. I go right at Patrick. I draw three fouls on him in the first half and I make the foul shots. So he starts me in the second half. So I, I was a lot more relaxed, you know, at that point. And it's a duel now. Patrick scores, I score. Patrick scores, I score. So we we I had, you know, my best college game against Patrick Ewing, you know, because, you know, I I was able to do just what I was just explaining. If I yeah. you know, I did all of that and then I was able to stay in the game. And now you can settle down and play, you know. And you got your confidence up, and you're in a rhythm. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of nerve wracking when you're when you're so over trying to uh, to do well. You don't want to make any mistakes because you know if you make a cup, you're coming out. Yeah. You no, know? and they go. He'll go put Eddie back in, and Eddie's not done taking a sip of water yet. You know. <laughs> so it was. Uh, it's like that. It's it's not easy. You know, it really isn't. You have to have it. And listen, right now, I'll be honest with you, they have team psychologists now in college sports. I wish they would have had one then because then I, I would have, I think it would have benefited me greatly because then you could have somebody like a sounding board to, to have somebody understand what you're talking about. When I'm talking to Wyatt, Wyatt's just mad that he's not playing at yeah. that point. You know, so I can't. He didn't want to hear it. He's yeah, like, hey, he you're playing. My problem. Your yeah. problem is your problem is you're not playing enough. My problem is I'm not playing at all. Yeah. You know? So it's it's something to be said for that, you know. So this team, uh, and and I want to we'll get to your presence a little bit down in the in the as we get to the tournament. I mean, you're you're basically you're you're playing minutes every game, and your team yeah. is now, you know, on the bubble. I mean, you know, after the Big East tournament, you guys are. Do you remember where you guys got together to to, to look at the first year? This is the first year it's a field of sixty four. Do you remember where you guys got together to find out? Oh yeah, I have photos of it and everything. Um, up in Jake Nevin, on the second floor, there was rooms. They had a big conference room there, and we had the TV in there, and we had you know we had food, of course. We, no Massimino get together without food. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we we had sandwiches and sodas and stuff like that. So that was back where Tedesito's office was, off to the yeah, left, exactly, right? Right up. Yeah, there, my yeah. mom used to work to the right. Yeah, I know. I know that right area well. Yeah. So so now so now what happens is nobody, including Coach Mass, realized that they went to sixty four teams that year. Nobody was thinking that. You know, we were like, are we going to get in? Are we going to get in? We're going to get in. We were nineteen and. Uh, we we were nineteen and ten, no, we were, we we were, yeah, was it nineteen and ten? Sure. Yeah, we we wound up nine. Yeah, we were nineteen and ten. So so now we don't know what's going to happen, and now they announce that Villanova is going to be the eight seed, and we're going to play the ninth seed Dayton. Dayton in Dayton, right? On their home court. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you were nineteen and ten. You got it right, nineteen and ten. Coach Mass, Coach Mass was living. Oh, he was. 
Oh, he goes, yeah, we're in, but we got to go play them on their home court. That, that's nonsense. I can't believe they did that to us. And he was flipping, you know, that we were playing on their court, you know. So, so you I, go to Dayton, and you guys play. It was it, those rules. it was one of those early games, though, right? It was the first game. Okay. Yeah. So it was the first game. So maybe you have that going for you. It's it's like a, a matinee game because you're playing on their home floor. What do you remember uh, f- from that game? Because you guys win with the Harold Jensen layup. I guess that was yeah. the game winning shot. With with time running yeah. down, I mean, the, it, it's it was literally touch and go all game. Yep, yep. I mean, it, it was back and forth games. But might have been, if you look back on it, it, it might have been the toughest game one of the toughest games uh, in that run. But the funny thing is, like I said, you don't know what goes on, you know, at, at the games and stuff. So. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. So we're on the bench, and the Dayton Flyer is uh, uh, the mascot. And he's a big guy with a gigantic head with blonde hair and the goggles like he's flying a plane. And he looks suspiciously like Wyatt Make. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so... So we we're all ribbon wide. Like, what are you doing cheering for the other team? You know, what are you, you know, as the game's going on, we're, you know, this is what the talk is. Okay. So now, as you say, Jensen gets the ball on the right side, the right foul line extended. He, he loops around and he goes down the middle and everybody's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he, and he went in and the ball rolled around the rim and went in. So now there's two seconds left. They have to take the ball out and, uh, Coach Mass goes, Chuck, go check in. I said, okay, two seconds. Okay. So I run in, check in. I sit on the bench. So he says, look, here's what they're going to do. I want you to get up on the ball. I want you to make it difficult for this guy. He's going to run the baseline. You're going to chase him. They're going to try to step in and take a charge on you. If that happens, you're walking home. (laughs) So I'm like, okay, I get it. They're going to try to take a charge. He goes, no, you don't understand. This is what they're going to do. Okay. So sure enough, the guy runs the baseline. I stop three feet in front of the guy with my hands up. He has to throw it up in the air. Presley picks the ball off. We win the game. And everybody mobs me because I didn't screw up the play. <laughs> so everybody's coming to me, and I'm going, that was two seconds. That way, what, what could I do wrong in two seconds? And now it's on to the second round. And in the second round, you, you play the second seed in Michigan and, and, and Roy Tarpley. I think they were top seed, I think, at the time. <laughs> Um, what are we doing here, Rusty? What are we going to do? Uh, yep, we're doing the uh, King of the Hill Rewatch Podcast. King of the Hill yes, Rewatch sir. Podcast. Yeah, so we're going to go through one episode at a time. Uh, come along for the ride with us. Come check it out. And, and give me give me a good, um, like, Dale Gribble quote to go out on. Wingo! Yeah, Wingo. 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 All right. Well, join us. Uh, join us for uh, the uh, King of the Hill rewatch podcast. Maybe in the heart of Texas, that drinks his brew and he spits his chew. Maybe in the heart of Texas, the TV players, but no one cares. Maybe in the heart of Texas. Here we go. 911, what's your emergency? Do you hear that? It's coming from the house. It's coming from inside the house? Uh, Do you mean, could it be? The The Bolter House. New from Rogue Media, two haunted hotties talking about haunted places. Every episode, we dive deep into the darkest places and give you a bit of history. We're getting spooky in all the right places. You've gobbled your last ghoul. Follow along for the craziest and spookiest stories with Debbie's Dark Tourism. The Stanley Hotel, Winchester House, The Alamo, Hotel Monte Vista, and more spooky places. Find us at the underscore Poltergals. P-O-L-T-E-R-G-A-L-S. Look over your shoulder. It's us, the Poltergals. Wherever you consume the podcast, you can find us there. Hey, 
Hey, y'all. I'm April. Hi, I'm Caroline. And we have a new podcast for you. What's it called, Caroline? Uh, Bloody Happy Hour. It's going to be your new favorite guilty pleasure. We're going to talk about some bloody stuff. Serial killers. True crime. Rape. <laughs> Rapists. Why not join us? We'll have a good time. You literally never know. I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Bloody happy hour. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, yeah, they were. No, they were the two seed. They were the two seed. Yeah. Um, oh, no, okay, you're right. You're like, there were, there were, there were, there were, no, they were, they were number one seed again. in the Southeast, number two number one, right? overall. They were number one in, in your, yeah, in the Southeast. So you're right. So you're playing the second ranked team in the country um, yeah. in, in, in the second round. How do you guys beat Michigan? Because you beat, you beat them. I mean, you know, it's another four point game. Yeah, we played we played tremendous defense on their on their bigs on Tarpley and um, Joe Bear. They had and Peyton. I think Peyton uh, was on that team. Um, yeah, and and then we had a leprechaun, and they didn't. <laughs> and that's what happened. It was it was St. Patrick's Day, right? It was St. Patrick's Day, and Jake Nevin told Coach he had a toy leprechaun's hat. And he said, when I think the game is out of reach and we're going to win, I'm going to put this hat on. He goes, don't do that, Jake. You know, you're crazy. You can't do that. He goes, oh, I'm doing it. We're, we're going to win this game. Okay. I don't know, three, four minutes left to go in the game. I look down the, I look down the end of the bench. He's got a leprechaun. <laughs> and he looks like a leprechaun. If You, you knew Jake. Yeah. I mean, he, he looks like a leprechaun. I'm like, well. There's some mysterious forces at work here. We have our own leprechaun, and nobody else does. Give us a little so background think- on Jake for folks who don't know. I mean, he was the athletic trainer when when, when you arrive, right? The, yeah. the head athletic trainer. And then yeah. he comes down with Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, right? Mm-hmm. And then, so obviously he's, by the time 85 comes around, he's he's really slowing down. He's in a wheelchair, but he's with you guys everywhere. He's with us everywhere. Um, and he's a prankster. Yeah, well, Jake. Jake uh, was at Villanova, I think, since 1927. Wow. And, uh, you know, so what happened was with him, you know, he was that guy that kept everybody loose. um, And he can get away with it because he was Jake. Everybody loved him. He was beloved by the entire campus. You know, I would go to early in my career, I would go to him up until the time he couldn't do it anymore. He would tape my ankles just so I can talk with him, you know. And he would do stuff like uh, on white tube socks. He wrote right, right and left on Eddie's sock. <laughs> which one to put on. They were the exact same sock, you know? Um, you know, stuff like that. And then then he would uh, he would cut guys ties. Uh, you know, if you fell asleep, he'd cut your tie or he'd uh, he'd burn you with his uh, lighter from his cigar. He would smoke cigars all the time. So one day I'm in training room and. Dwight Wilbur was in before me and they do this thing that had a staring contest. Like they always, you know, whoever blinks first. Dwight and Jake. Yeah. So he goes, I go, come on, I got to get taped. I got to go up. If I'm late to practice, I'm dead, you know? So Dwight goes, all right, I got to go. So he leaves. Dwight, uh, Jake starts taping my ankle. He goes, hang on a second. He climbs up on this bench and now he's looking out the back window out to the football field. I said, what are you doing? He goes, you'll see. And Dwight Wilbur comes around and looks in the glass, and Dw- and Jake's already there staring. <laughs> before, and so Dwight was like, like you know, I can't win. And so, um, so yeah, so he was, you know, there's a million stories about Jake Nevin. Uh, he was just a magical guy, and he was Sister told, Jean before there was Sister Jean. I mean, yeah, in, yeah, in, in a way, except told, for he was he a told Coach Mass. If you remember, after the championship, Coach was going to take a job with the new jersey Nets. oh yeah i was going to ask you about that yeah yeah so he basically took it what's that he basically took the job he basically took it the night before they had a a roast and they were giving him the business about going to planet lovetron with daryl dawkins (laughs) and all this other stuff and so he comes in the office to let us know and and the night before we as captains me prez uh rc and dwight led the team down to coach's house and said, Hey, we got to talk. The whole team knocked on the door. And we went in the backyard and talked about it. And, um, 
you know, he, you know, he said, I'll let you guys know in the morning. I'll be there, be there at seven 30. Jeez. So we're in the office at seven 30 waiting to hear if he's coaching or he's not coaching. And he walks in and the first guy he sees is Jake. And Jake said, if I had known it was going to come to this, I wouldn't have let you win the Georgetown game. <laughs> I wouldn't have let you win the Georgetown game, you know? So he goes, don't worry, I'm staying. But Jake was that kind of guy. Jake was, you know, and there was a lot of crazy stuff that happened after he passed away, Pete, that is just nuts. Yeah, yeah, like almost ghost ghost type stuff. Yeah, whip. okay, I'll, I'll tell you. A- Give me one, yeah. So whip, whip. At this point now, we're playing in the pavilion. So you played the, in the in the field house, which became the Jake Nevin field, field house. house yeah, which is named after Jake now. Yeah. So so they call it Jake's place. You know. So we're playing. We're going to practice in the pavilion. And it's February the 9th, which happens to be Jake's birthday. Okay. Something happens. The light goes out. The the uh, the the box explodes or whatever. We can't practice in the pavilion. There's no lights. We have to go up because the sun is shining through the glass in Nevin. We have to go up and play in his gym on his birthday. You know, with stuff like like that. So now we go to play a game. We go to play a game right before his birthday, like a couple days before. And uh, we're playing uh, Temple, I believe it was, at the Spectrum. So we had pregame meal, and after pregame meal, four or five of us go to Jake's grave site, and we light a cigar because Jake so Jake always had the cigar. And, and I don't know whether he sucked on the cigar real hard or he blew on it or whatever he did, but he made the flame shoot out of the top of the cigar. So we all grab a cigar, and we we put our finger in the ground. So we put a cigar in the ground for Jake and we're laughing and we said a prayer and we're talking about Jake and everybody puffs on their cigar, you know, and all of a sudden two big puffs of smoke come out of the cigar in the ground, (laughs) which, you know, and I know there's no puffing, there's no smoke coming out unless somebody's (laughs) smoking the cigar. Okay. So Wyatt said, it must've went out. Let me, let me pick it up. He puts it in his mouth. And we go to relight it, and the flame shot up and singed why it had a mustache. Yeah. Singed this mustache. <laughs> we were like, okay, Jake, put the cigar down. There were a bunch of stories like that, Chuck. I remember, as you know, I and and, and, and as Villanova people, and with the Jake, you know, the, the lure and the and the aura around him, like, we love that shit. I mean, I, I can remember my mom telling me stories about a guy being there who was older who was like an unidentified guy that was in, at Jake Nevin. You know what I mean? And, like stuff Nevin, like that. They threw him out of the gym. Yeah. And and the security guard said there was a picture in the paper the next day of Jake. He goes, I just threw that guy out of the gym last night. Yeah. Yeah. He goes, I, you couldn't have thrown him out of the gym last night. He's dead. Yeah. So let's go. So we go, let's go back to the Michigan game. So now you guys, <laughs> we went on St. Patrick's day. Now you're on to the sweet 16 and, and there's something clearly that's behind this team. What's that gap like when you guys go back to Villanova before you had, I guess it was to Birmingham uh, to, yeah. f- for, for the regionals? Well, you know, it, it got intense. You know, the practices, as I said before, got intense. And we saw that we had a chance now to move forward and do something. You know, we have, now we're in the Sweet 16. We had gotten to the Elite Eight my first year with John uh, Pannone and those guys. And Eddie was on that team with Gary and Dwayne. And, uh, but last year we got knocked out in the second round. So we've already gotten further than we got last year, but we have felt that there was more in us and we wanted to take each game as it comes. We had a big challenge in garden Lenny bias. You're playing Maryland again. Yeah. Lenny had 30 plus the first time. And uh, Ed, Ed did a magnificent job of guarding him, but everybody doubled down. As soon as, as soon as Lenny got the ball, there was two or three guys on him at all times. And Lenny winds up scoring eight points. Never been done before or since. No one's ever held them in single digits. You know, we held them to eight points and we win that game. Um, that was another great, um, again, we were confident going into the game because coach had four days to prepare. Yeah, uh, for that game, and we usually didn't win. And if you watch the games, it's pretty funny because Coach Mass was superstitious. The first round games of each bracket of each site, he wore a navy blue suit. The second game, he wore that beige. Yeah, 
Uh-huh. So he so <laughs> He uh he would do that all the way. If we won, he kept doing that the, the rest of the way. So he had the blue suit on. We beat Lenny. And what's the vibe around the team? Like, do you guys feel like um, there's a little more, I guess, Gary, um, you know, Dwayne and Ed, do you, do, are they taking on that leadership role kind of as as, as things yeah. start to snowball? Yeah, especially on the floor. Like, I mean, Gary was super, I mean, dude. He was in control of those games. I mean, yeah. you you felt like when he had the basketball, it was like a yo-yo, and it wasn't gonna. You knew he wasn't gonna turn it over. I mean, you just knew that. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. so yeah, it's, he, he was good that way. I mean, you could hear him in some of the games if you go back and watch the films and stuff. You can hear him talking over the announcers. He'd tuck the ball under his arm and say, "Hey, you go here, you go here." Yeah, you know. So I mean, you you really he got a good feel for what he was all about. So then you, you guys move forward. How do you beat North Carolina? I mean, how do you get ready for North Carolina, and how do you, how do you upset them? Well, we got ready the way we always do. We, we had walk through in the parking lot the morning of the game, and, <laughs> you know, you only had a day. to. Re- we're in the parking lot walking through their plays. They took a parking space, and that was the foul line, the key and everything, <laughs> you know, and uh, <clears throat> we would go through their stuff, and, you know, we all knew what was at stake. Uh, everybody was amped up and they, and they wanted to get there for coach because coach had gotten there a bunch of times and lost to North Carolina, you know? So there was a bunch of times when North Carolina got in the way of us getting to, uh, greener pastures, you know? So we really wanted to do it for coach mass. Um, and we were so tight, man. The first half was really, you know, we didn't play horribly bad, but we didn't play ourselves. Everybody was was tight and everybody made mistakes again that over trying thing um was in full play how does coach Massimino loosen you guys up to to, to get out there and oh, win? this was the famous pasta speech at oh. halftime okay yeah tell so, people that so story. what happens is he walks in and he takes his coat off and he loosens his tie and he turns a chair about, around and he sits on the chair backwards you know and he's leaning on the top of the chair and he goes hey you know where I'd rather be right now than right here with you guys? I'd rather be at home eating a bowl of macaroni and and, uh, and pasta sauce and clam sauce with a lot of cheese on it. I want to have, you know, clam sauce and a lot of cheese on it, you know? And everybody's looking at him like, what are you talking about? You know, what does that have to do with anything? And he said, look, you know, basically what he was saying was just go out and play. It doesn't matter. We're here. Just go out and play and have fun. You guys aren't, he goes, it's not that important. You know, I, if, if I knew you were going to play like this and you weren't going to, you weren't going to be yourselves, I'm shit. I'd rather be eating a bowl of pasta right now. So everybody's eyes exploded and we went out and had a half, no, like no other all year long. And Harold Jensen became Harold Jensen, you know, made some plays in that game that were phenomenal. One I remember on the right side of the court, dove on the floor, tapped it out to somebody. We got a layup. We were getting dunks. We were getting, you know, and they had no shot. Okay. Yeah, you, you guys blew them out, right? We blew them out in the second half, yeah. Because he he gave us, he basically gave us permission to go out and have fun. He just said, you know, hey, listen, what are you worried about? We lose, we lose, you know. We're still going to eat pasta, so go out and have some fun. So now, you know? now you guys are going to the Final Four, and I and I won't keep your I, I I'll keep you just a little yeah. bit longer, and I'll let you get back to your life. But I'm I'm so, <laughs> I'm so interested in this. I'm sorry for for yeah, keeping you. I got I got time, so go ahead. Okay, well, so you guys are now you're going back to the Final Four, and, and as a kid, I remember this. There was such a the light switch really turned on. I mean, I was I was a young guy, but the fact is, you guys are going to the Final Four now. I mean, you guys came back to school. You mentioned rock stars was like, I mean, you guys really, it was amazing when you guys came back, you know, everybody, the field house was packed. What, what, what are your memories from that? I mean, just going to a whole nother level. And again, this is a small Catholic school that's not used to this kind of exposure. Uh, so it was, a, it, it was a next level thing to Villanova as the, as college basketball. Now CBS is involved. There's a ton of coverage. Everybody's talking about Villanova all over the country you know it wasn't really the case even back in the 70s when they were really good it just wasn't quite the coverage that basketball got yeah well it was like you said it was uh it was it was incredible there was more people in the jake nevin Fieldhouse than actually went to the school it was crazy (laughs) i mean it was 
people in the rafters, people everywhere hanging from it just to get a glimpse of us, you know, and I've said this HBO did a thing on us and they asked me the same question. And I said, for me, it was like being, uh, Tito Jackson or Ringo Starr, you know, I was in the band, <laughs> but I'm not the main guy. You know what I mean? Like people wanted a piece of you. Um, it was, it was bananas. You know, we went up there and, you know, Jensen gives a talk and another guy, you know, everybody talks, you know, and says a few things. And it was, it was phenomenal. And, uh, you know, people were rushing the stage because, you know, in, on the one end uh, in Nevin, there's a stage and now it's offices on that. Stage. Yeah. They built it's a stage where Martin Luther King once spoke. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. So, so we're on that same stage where Martin Luther King spoke and people are going crazy. There was signs up everywhere and, it was just a lot of fun for us, and to be able to experience that uh, was really cool. What's the media? You know, I'm close with my man Craig Miller. What's what's the media yeah. coverage like at that point in time? I mean, as far as like now, it's like you got a whole week of, of hype and everything. And you're, you know, you're 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 an effective player. You're a seven footer. People know yeah. you. People know you're you're more than Tito Jackson. Um, right. So, w- what was that whole experience like? Just being a part of that and being a part of that 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 white hot spotlight well, it, it was cool but again you know coach mash used to always tell us uh, remember who you are and who you represent so again he gave us an opportunity to to make mistakes um but in this particular case you know he made sure that you you know you know who you are who you're representing you're not representing the name on the back of your shirt it's on the front of your shirt you know that kind of thing and we all were and to this day everybody took that to heart i mean if you know, most of these guys do a great job of that type of thing, even today, you know, and at that point, Mills, uh, Craig was the hardest working guy at Villanova at that point, because he was getting, he was getting, um, he was getting uh, requests, he was getting beseeched with requests from everybody and their mother uh, to talk to all the guys on the team. It was, it was nuts at that point. It was a one man operation. And you know, it's funny how like, yeah. it's, I, I, you could talk to Craig about it, that whole thing projected him to, to USA basketball and they're doing communications yeah. for the dream team. I mean, it's like everybody has their, their moment, right. Where they have the opportunity right. to rise to the occasion was having a guy like coach mass who was so colorful and excitable. Did that take pressure off you guys almost because it's, he was just such a personality. Yeah, uh, I think so. Um, because now he was, he was obviously getting the brunt of, uh, all the media retention and rightly so. Um, yeah, I, I think that took some pressure off of us because he handled a lot of that. Um, you know, Eddie and Dwayne and Gary got a lot. Prez got a lot. Uh, and Jensen started to get some. Um, so I, I would agree with that. You know, I would agree that, you know, it made it a little bit easier for us at that point. You know? what, what, what is the r- literal road to the Final Four like? You, you get to Lexington and there's three Big East teams, Georgetown, St. John's and Villanova. Villanova probably wasn't expected at the party, but but there you are, you know, and <laughs> yeah. and, and you play in that first game against Memphis State. And Memphis State is awesome. They have Keith yeah. Lee, Andre Turner. This is a really exciting basketball team. How are you guys yeah. getting ready to take on an, another monster? Or at this point, is it just business as usual? Hey, we're it's gonna just business as usual, you know. And then the, the one thing that happened, some people don't know this. Um, we go to the hotel. We stayed at the Ramada. It was a, like a motel, you know. <laughs> And we get there and there are some people there from Memphis State and they were telling, you know, basketball people and they're telling the people at the front desk when they lose and we're online behind them waiting to check in. When they lose, we want all their rooms for Monday night. We're going to need all their rooms for Monday. And we're sitting there going, well, that ain't going to happen. You know, <laughs> yeah. that, just, that just sealed their fate right <laughs> there, you know. So we went out and uh, and did what we had to do, um, you know, in that game and. Uh, you know, we did a good job on Keith Lee and uh, played a great game. And William Bedford too. The finals. Now, the the thing I remember is out in the out in the parking lots, there were Winnebago's, Villanova people were all over the place uh, in the parking lots and Winnebago's and stuff like that. So uh, we a few of us went out in between games and met with uh, met with some folks that we knew <laughs> from the, you know, and that was kind of cool hanging out there. Were you surprised bit. how well the school traveled? For for something like that, no, because everybody was excited. I, you know, everybody tried to find a way to Lexington. You know, um, a lot of people got like 
got in their car and just drove and worried about tickets when they got down there. It was a college thing and everybody was like looking to maximize their college experience, you know? Yeah. Well, yours is certainly being maximized. You, you now are playing Georgetown <laughs> yeah. for the, for the third time that year. Yeah. I think you lost to him once in overtime uh, and then you <laughs> lost to him in a real close game. Another time um, yeah. when you, when you play in Landover at, at Georgetown. So now uh, what is that? Like you're, you're getting set to play in this game, by the way, you know, it's Patrick Ewing versus Villanova, and Patrick is God. You know, he's going to – people thought – I I don't know exactly what the spread was, but it well, was, was like – quote. That was a quote in USA Today, Villanova versus a God, and there was a picture of Patrick. Yeah. You know, it was, you know, it was crazy, you know. And the one thing we did was we put a new press break in, in the parking lot like that the morning of the game. You know, we went in the parking lot and we worked on something that Mitch Bonagoro came up with and talked to Coach Mass about where we stepped somebody, Dwayne McLean stepped out of bounds and we threw the ball. Oh, that was out awesome. Out of bounds. And then we stepped in and we're able to get the ball in because they were like, what are they doing? No one's ever done that. You know, it's 100% legal and no one realized that you could do that. You we can, if you're out of ball, out of bounds, inbound, inbounding the ball, you can pass to somebody else out of bounds. Right. And then they can, he's got to have both feet out of bounds before he catches it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and that's and only after a made basket. You can't do that after a regular, you know, it's only after a made basket. So they would score. We would do that, get the ball in bounds and be able to break the press. And then they couldn't, you know, and then when we're making shot after shot, they can't run their fast break. So that slowed the game down when we, we controlled the tempo of the game. Um, you know, and people say we played a perfect game, but we had 17 turnovers, you know? Yeah. Um, it, it, I mean, listen, I mean, it, you make almost eighty percent of your shots. There's a good chance you're gonna win. <laughs> well, at the end, and, and, and we only won by two. Yeah, at the end of the first half, you get in a little scuffle with with Reggie Williams. I remember yeah. that very well. There was an air ball, and then underneath the basket, you guys get tangled up. It leads to this fever pitch going into the locker room. Coach Mass is trying to figure out what's going on. I think you guys are up thirty to twenty nine. I've watched the game about a thousand times when I was a kid. Right. You guys are up thirty to twenty nine. What but what happened with, with between you and Reggie Williams? There was cl- we were close to a fight almost. Yeah, we were. Um, <laughs> so you know, the, we they they let us hold the ball at the end of the half to forever. Now, that's right. Time, now it was now it was time for us to try to score. Somebody Prez took a shot. I tipped it up and hit the rim. Prez gets the rebound and puts it in. We go up one, going down the other end. Wingate is coming down the floor. I'm out ahead of Reggie. I, I'm i I'm thinking I got to box Reggie out hard because if he puts a finger on the ball and tips this in, uh, I gonna have, I'm going to have hell to pay in the locker room, <laughs> you know? So that's all I'm thinking. So I put a hard, clean box out on him. And, um, you know, he hit me, pushed me, whatever you want to call it, another night in the Big East kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, I'm furious because I know I'm not getting back in the game in the second half. You know, Eddie, Eddie, unless Eddie broke his leg or something, which nobody wanted that to happen. Um, you know, you know, I wasn't going to play. He was going to play those guys till they couldn't play anymore. And, um, you know, so I, and I wasn't going to be able to chase Reggie down and catch him. So I'm screaming at the referee, Brian Harrington runs out, coach runs out and coach pumps his fist and goes in there. And when we go in the locker room, we have to cross each other in the back, you know? So, they're snickering and laughing like we got this. It's no big deal. We get in the locker room now. I've I've since then. Reggie and I are very good friends. You know, I mean, I went I went to the Villanova Georgetown game this year on campus, and Reggie came as my guest to the game. <laughs> we sat, we sat together behind the Villanova bench. That's great. So Reggie and I are really good friends. I've been out with his his wife and and him and me and my wife and. You know, really, really, really great guy. So the funny thing was we had Reggie on our show. And we had, And Sonny asked him about it. And he said, uh, you know, I wanted to get him off me, whatever. I said, hey, listen. I said, I think I owe you dinner or something. I just want to say thank you for my 15 minutes of fame. He goes, what are you talking about? I go, you don't hit me in the mouth. Nobody knows me. Nobody knows nothing. I said, I get the game's over. I got 30 or 40 reporters in front of me. I'm like, what do you guys want to talk to me for? He goes, well, Reggie Williams, what happened? What happened? So I've milked that for 37 <laughs> or eight years, man. I got more out of that than than, than anybody else. Yeah. And, uh, 
So I said, I, you know, I think I owe you dinner. He goes, yeah, you do. So <laughs> Sonny and I took him out for dinner. I paid for dinner. And, uh, <laughs> rest, <laughs> the rest has been, we've, we've been buddies. We've been together four or five times since then. A literal Big East Rewind right yeah, there. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. But so this, and the second half, you guys come out, and I think uh, the world thought at some point Georgetown is going to, you know, wake up. People not knowing any yeah. better that, that this was really what the rivalry was all about. You know, you got like for the average fan is watching these two teams play for the first time, but it was very clear that you guys were not scared of them at, right. at all. But, and they were a scary force. They were very intimidating. How does that, that second half, you continue to shoot the lights out. And at some point it's like, wow, they, they might really win this thing. Yeah. Well, we were nine for 10 in the second half. You know, do you know the guy who missed the shot in the second half? Uh, That's a question for you. Who missed the shot in the second half? Plansky. Yep. No, Plansky didn't get in. He he missed the foul shot. He missed a free throw when Gary foul. got hurt. Right. Uh, all right. Gary got hurt. Who missed the field goal? Dwayne McLean got his shot blocked by Patrick Ewing. And that's the miss. Any shot that got to the rim went in. The only one that didn't get to the rim, Patrick blocked it. You know, so um, – the trivia question answer is Dwayne McLean. <laughs> That's a great question, dude. <laughs> yeah, and we and we uh, we tease him all the time about that. You know, is but, there, uh, is there a, is there a moment down the stretch where you're like, wow, we're going to win this? Just take us through the final moments of that that whole game. Well, first of all, first of all, you're not in control of your faculties, really, especially when you're on the bench. You know, so Jensen's on the foul line, and Wyatt and I are in prayer like this, like, come on, make the shot, you know, that kind of thing, you know. And I look to my left, and Wyatt's sitting on my right side. I look to my left, and I, I go, what the heck? I hear these this noise. Click, 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 click. I look over. There's 200 photographers pointing at me and Wyatt. And I go, hey. I said to Wyatt, I go, hey, don't move. We're going to be in every paper in the country tomorrow, win or lose. We're going to be in every paper in the country. <laughs> and there's a picture of us like this praying, and we were. I said, I said to him, if we win this game, I said, we have to get the coach first and carry him off the court. That's we have to. So he says, yeah, I agree. So that's what happened. And that's how that iconic picture, there's a great photo of Wyatt and I carrying him off the floor. And um, that's how that happened because we saw what was going on. And, but the, the other stuff that's happening is, you know, Georgetown is trying to prolong the game. They're punching the ball up in the stands. They're, the, uh, Horace Broadnax tackled Presley to try to make it look like it was a charge. He he hugged them and pulled them down. It was the, honestly, it was so crafty. It was it Coach was, Thompson at his I give at his a best. Lot of credit for that move. Who thought? Who thinks of that? Now, yeah, and and, and, and as a fan, we looked at the wrong time. You would have thought Presley ran him over. And as a fan, you were like, "Oh my God, they're going to find a way to pull this." So it was crazy. I was like, "Right?" I was like, "They, they yeah. are going to." I can't imagine what it was like as a player. Uh, so yeah. what's it like the aftermath of of this whole thing? I mean, oh, it just it just explodes. I have never before in my life been moved to tears out of sheer joy in my whole life. I mean, I, I mean, it was, it was incredible. The, I can't even describe how great a, a feeling that was. You wish you can put that in a bottle and save it for a tough day. Yeah. You know, because it was, it was so, um, the exuberance was uh, in, off the charts, you know, and then, and then to celebrate with those guys, you know, and be as close as we are even to this day. It's just phenomenal. And, and you, my mom, I remember, I was I went to St. Thomas Good Council in Bryn Mawr. She comes and takes me out of school, and we go to my dad's office. He worked for Amtrak. And the parade, I mean, as a kid, it, I'm sure it would seem larger than life today, but there must have been a million people down there. And, yeah. and again, you're talking about the suburban school, and now you've got everybody in the whole city that's fallen in love with, with, with Villanova because of, you know, this this – underdog aspect and everybody loved you guys and coach mass well it was crazy because that parade was impromptu you know we had no idea we get off the plane and they they uh we get off the plane and there was a couple thousand people at the airport like we 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 flew um uh we didn't fly commercial we flew private on that on that trip and we got off the plane and we're walking across the tarmac to get in to get our stuff or whatever and there's a few thousand people behind the fence with signs and all the stuff. And they whisk us away and got the team into a flatbed truck and they started to go down Market Street. <laughs> That's how the parade started. Now, the other two championships we've had were planned out and was two or three days after the game. 
this was we went right from the airport right into the thing and we were off and you know we were all exhausted of course you know everybody was asleep on the plane there's some pictures of guys hugging the trophies asleep you know well, and, uh, how did you guys end up flying private? Do you remember, like who Coach Mass talks to, or how that comes? No, I, I don't, I don't. Yeah. I think, I think in the playoffs we flew that way, um, you know, for most of the playoffs. And then there were guys in our entourage, so there were seats available to certain people. Mostly media guys all flew with us. I remember Howard Eskin being on the plane. <laughs> of course, he was. You know, with Joe. Uh, <laughs> Ask him was on the plane. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Gary Papa, the late Gary. Yeah, Papa. yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of guys that were on. I'm, I'm leaving a bunch of guys out. But so part serious. of the fallout afterwards, and you talk about, we talk about Gary, like people, you know, you're standing next to him, you know, at the Rose Garden. And he, like, yeah. it, it, when, when the president is honoring you guys, and he's saying, he writes an article in Sports Illustrated. Um, or it gets co-written with him. He's on the covers. I remember Craig Miller used to always go to Roach and O'Brien's, and the guy Franny who who owned it hated Villanova, so he had the cover with Gary on it, and he would give Craig shit. I remember that, and Craig would want to strangle him. But you know, the cover of Sports Illustrated is Gary McLean, a year in the clouds, and it talks about this guy was addicted to cocaine during that whole run. Do you have like any like like what is your what do you take from that like? As, as a teammate when something like that well, comes out of left field. I'll, 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 I'll be real with you, okay? First of all, it was very, very hurtful to Coach Mass. It happened two years after we won, okay? 87, that article came out. It was the first time an article was started on the cover of Sports Illustrated, mm. and it was 21 pages long, okay? And he said a lot of things, and he got paid a lot of money to do that, okay? Almost 100 and, grand at the time. Yeah. And, and so the guys on the team know, listen, it was the eighties. People tried things back in the eighties. Okay. But there is no way, no how some of the things that he said he did happened. It couldn't have, you know, because of where we were and who we were with and, and everything like that. Plus he implicated everybody and named nobody, which was the worst thing about it, because I'll tell you the truth. And I, and I, I don't talk about this very much, but I'll tell you, Pete, you know, I'd go on job interviews and not only me, you know, other guys, you try to get jobs on wall street and stuff like that. After you're done playing. Once they found out I played at Villanova and I was a teammate of his, I was told we don't need you. Thank you. See ya. You know, I mean, five or six interviews I got kicked out of, you know, people come up and they say, Hey, you were on that team where everybody was high on cocaine. And you know, you guys shouldn't have, you know, you, you guys cheated. You were, I go, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, so this went on for a little bit. Okay. And occasionally you get a, an occasional idiot that says that to you. But so here's what happens. HBO did a big special on us called the perfect upset. It's on, you can go on YouTube and check it out. It's really, really a good documentary, kind of like a 30 for 30 before they were a thing. It's HBO did that stuff before 30 HBO for 30 did, did it. It's yeah. awesome. It's awesome. So, okay. So they coach mass dubbed me the social director. So anytime there was any media thing, they would people would call me because I'm kind of the hub of that team. And this is afterwards. Guys together. Yeah. So HBO one, I'm doing a camp. So they want to come down and shoot at the camp for what they call B footage, you know, some soft footage in case they need it. I call Gary up. I say, Hey, I want you to come down and speak at the camp. Okay. I call coach. Hey, I want you to come and speak at the camp. Okay. I don't tell the other one that the other one's going to be there. And at this point in time, Gary's kind of getting his life together. This He's is sober. 18 years after the article was written. They hadn't spoken in 18 years. Wow. Now, Gary has made his peace with all of us, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so now we come down and I bring Coach down. Coach calls me up. He goes, where the hell is this place, Everson? I said, listen, you're almost here. Come down the road, make a right, and you'll be at the gym. I'm waiting with you with Gary outside. He goes, with who? I said, it ends today, coach. He wants to talk to you. It ends today. So he says, I am going to kill you. I said, well, you're going to have to kill me later. <laughs> this, this, is, this is over today. No one can take this anymore. It's 18 years. It's enough. So they go in. I put them in a room. I close the door and I stand in front of the door. I guard the door. HBO has got no clue about what's going on behind the door. 
nor do they ask. They're out shooting video of kids playing basketball, okay? You hear yelling, screaming, crying, tears, hugs. They come out arm in arm. We go to my friend's uh, restaurant next to the place, and we go out. Uh, Frank Bolton, uh, Bolton uh, owns the uh, New York, uh, the Long Island Ducks. He's a Villanova guy. And we go throw the first pitch out along with Brian Harrington at the Long Island Ducks game. And everything's cool, okay? And then years years later, you know, Gary's been up and down in his life. Yeah. We, we, go, to, we go to Florida. Um, every year we were going to Florida for the last 15 or 16 years of Coach's life. And uh, we would go down as a team and hang out and watch him play and all that kind of stuff. We would get down on a Thursday. What, because he, to, he coached week. Northwood, I guess? or Yeah, Northwood, and yeah. then it became Kaiser. Okay. So – Friday was uh, Italian dinner, big, huge dinner at his house. Saturday was a Kaiser game. Sunday was the Super Bowl, and we all get on the red eye and go home. So I'm in the airport flying down for one of the last times we're going to get together before he passes away. And a um, guy comes up to me and says, hey, you played at Villanova, right? I go, yeah. He goes, you, you know Gary McClain? I said, yeah. So now I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop, you know? So he says, uh, could you do me a favor? Could you tell him that John McGregor says to say thank you? I said, John, you got to give me more than that. He said, well, he saved my son's life. My son had a very bad drug problem, and Gary was his therapist. And now he's been clean for eight years. He's able to have a job and a family. He's got two kids now, and he's doing great. And if it wasn't for Gary, he'd be dead. I said, wow, that's pretty heavy. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to Florida. I'm going to be down there in two hours. And when I get there, I'm going to call Gary and tell him you said that. So I did. And when I got to Florida, I called Gary. And Gary was like, oh, that's so nice to hear. You know, you never get to know what happened after they leave the program. Because mm -hmm. he's been doing this, you know. He goes, hey, can you talk to Coach and see if it's okay um, that I come to the uh, – you know, to the, to the game on Saturday. So we're at dinner a Friday night at coach's house and I grab coach and I pull him in the kitchen. I go, Hey, listen, this is what happened. I tell him the story. I just told you, I said, Gary wants to come to the game. Is it okay? He goes, yeah, tell him, bring him down a half hour before the other guys get here. I want to talk to him. So he gets him in the locker room and he tells Gary how proud he is of him, how he's doing great things. And, you know, Chuck tells me that this guy uh, came up to him out of the blue and, you know, he's obviously not BSing me, I said, because he didn't know I was going to be there. He just came and this is what he said. So coach coach told him, hey, listen, you know, enjoy the game. We're going to go to, you know, Duffy's after the game. It's a sports bar. We have something to eat there. And, you know, so now he comes up. Coach comes to me at Duffy's. And he says, uh, hey, what do you think? Should I bring him? Should I bring him to the uh, to the Super Bowl party? I said, absolutely. If you feel good with it, yeah, you should. So uh, so he did. So he brought him in and, you know, he he Gary, to his credit, uh, went right over to Mrs. Mass. He said to coach, he said, I don't want to cause any bad feelings between Mrs. Mass and the girls. You know, I know there's still feelings there and from what happened. And, you know, so he came and it was a fantastic visit. He was awesome, and everybody. Uh, he wound up taking home uh, leftovers to go <laughs> to go home with, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, and it's been and it was great right up until uh, the end of his life when Coach passed. Um, the biggest the biggest thing of all of it was when Coach passed. We went back down again to see Mrs. Mass. Uh, a bunch of us did, and Gary came with us and sat at the dinner table with everybody. And broke down because what we would do is we go around the table and talk about our families and what's going on and fill everybody in, you know, and Gary was the last one. And he, he said, I never thought I'd be at this table with you guys and you, Mrs. Mass, ever again. And I appreciate it. And he broke down. Everybody started crying and it was all good. So he's he's doing pretty good. He's, um, you know, he's a therapist. He helps people out every day. So, uh, you know, there's a happy ending, you know, to yeah. the story. Uh, that's great, Chuck. I, I can't thank you enough for sharing that um, yeah. because it's really cool because it was like, uh, you know, it was devastating to the villain of a family when all, when all that happened. And it was tough 
you know, you, you lived it, dude. I think that's a real window into yeah. how our actions affect other people in life. You know, um, you're going on job interviews and you're kind of getting the cold shoulder. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And not only me, like, yeah. like other guys had the similar experience, you know, and yeah. it's not easy. And, 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 you know, and it really, I mean, people are asking you know, Dwayne McLean if, if he's Gary McLean, you know, like all that, well, like, yeah, but yeah. they think, they think the, the two of them are brothers. Yeah, you know, because it's M C C L A I yeah. and M C L A I N. Yeah. So, so Dwayne has to explain. He gets it worse than anybody because he had he has to explain that that's not him. Yeah. You know, and uh, you know it's died down a little bit. I said, and and Gary is uh, Gary's good with all our guys. We're we're on text messages with uh, with the whole team. In fact, um, Craig Miller and Fran Ragazzino are on it. Yeah. Uh, Craig told Matt me you're you do an incredible it. job of keeping everybody together. It. Yeah. So yeah. we're all. We're all and and today, you know, actually is Mark Plansky's birthday. So we we've been texting back and forth, wishing Mark a happy birthday today. That's the stuff that we do. We've been doing that for years and years and years. So you want to talk know, about and, a strong bond? I can't imagine what it's yeah. like to be a part of that group. It's pretty cool. And and going and going down to Florida was was cool too because you'd get you know, especially the last time we were all going to get together, we kind of knew it might be Coach Mass's last go round with this. And so everybody showed up. So you had, <laughs> you had guys laid out on air mattresses on the floor, or <laughs> on the couch, in in a spare room, wherever you could find a, an area to, to sleep. That's where they slept. It was it was uh, it was great. And if like if you got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom or something, you had to watch where you were walking. <laughs> you might step on a six foot eight guy. Yeah. All right, la- last thing for you. Uh, first of all, the show is a big East Rewind, uh, yeah. and, and and people can look it up. They can catch it. It's YouTube. Uh, you guys do a great job with with the visuals, by the way. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, it's really cool. So, what was it like when Coach Mass went to UNLV? I mean, what, how how was that for you? I mean, was it a surprise? Uh, it was, it's almost one of those things that I, I, sometimes I'll do deep dives on it to find out more about it. I remember he went there. I remember Jay was with him. Uh, but what yeah. was that like for somebody like you who's part of the family but kind of rem- at that point you're a little removed? Well, you're never too far removed with Coach Mass, especially if you were loyal to him. You know, uh, the, the loyalty you showed him was you get back tenfold from him. Um, but that said, yeah, he left. It was a little bit of a different thing. I was kind of uh, thrown by that a little bit. Um, we've had a lot of conversations. I, I used to have to go, uh, once a year when I was working for mobile, um, we would have the conventions there. So we'd go to Vegas. So I'd go hang out with them. And, uh, you know, he was never really given a chance to succeed there. I yeah. think with, uh, with all the Tark's people, um, they took it personal. Like he was like, he kicked Tark out. He didn't kick Tark out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was tough. It was tough for him, I think. And then it was tough. Uh, how the Villanova community reacted to that. Yeah. You know? Very tough. And uh, Jay was Jay was instrumental in bringing him back into the fold at Villanova when Northwood came and played um, the Wildcats for our 30th reunion. Everybody was back uh, for that. And, uh, and, and Coach had a great time. He was mic'd up. So was Jay. Um, that part was awesome. I mean, they, Jay did a fantastic job of keeping him in the loop again, showing loyalty uh, to a guy that was loyal to him back then when, when Jay got his start in this business, you know, and uh, it was a godsend Jay Jay coming from Hofstra and just kind of bridging that gap. And then with the success that he's had, I mean, uh, you, you've got to love that. I mean, what's happened to Villanova? I mean, you know, Jay moves away. You're in the transitional year this year, but you know, up until this year, I mean, what, what an amazing ride it's been. You know, it really has, yeah, especially been. if you're an alum, because, you know, Jay, you know, when when Steve took over the program, I don't know. Exactly Lapis. What went yeah. on, but it was a little different. Mm-hmm. OK. And there wasn't a lot of guys going back to games and stuff like that. So when Jay got in, I'll never forget when when I was I want a trip to Mexico. I was getting on a red eye to go to Mexico from work. And I left Jay a message on his Hofstra voicemail. And I said, I don't even know if they talked to you yet, but I know where you're going. So I want to be the first to congratulate you. Just tell me it's okay to wear my Villanova stuff again. And uh, he said, we want everybody back. You tell everybody, everybody's welcome back. So I get home on a Sunday. On Monday, I'm in the car driving down to Villanova. 
before I even go back to work. I'm driving <laughs> down to Nova, and Marianne Gabuzda, who was the secretary for Coach oh, yeah. for years and years, is sitting there. And she looks at me, and she's like, what are you doing here? I go, well, I'm here to talk to the new coach. He goes, well, they're in a meeting. You're going to have to wait. I said, okay. So I'm, And that that's not like her, you know, yeah. because she's a little, you know. So uh, I'm sitting there, and Freddie Hill comes out, and he says, hey, Everson, right? I go, yeah. He goes, uh, well, aren't you part of the team? I said, yeah. He goes, well, the meeting's inside. What are you doing out here? I look at Marianne. I go, new sheriff, mayor. You know? <laughs> and ever since then, it's been it's been awesome. All, all the uh, Arlisha Davison does a great job uh, of bringing the alumni uh, back in, and I help her any which way I can. You were just back there uh, a couple nights ago. Yeah, I go back a lot actually, yeah. and it, it's funny because um, you know sometimes they want to hear from a from a former players. You know, there were guys that didn't come back for whatever the reason. And it was because they didn't understand how it works. You know, there are rules that you have, you know, have to follow when you go back. You can't just show up and say, I'm here. I need six tickets. Yeah. You know, um, you know, there are two tickets waiting for any former player for any regular season game of the season. You just got to call our Leisha and tell her you're coming and there'll be two tickets for you. And then the playoffs, um, it's one ticket, but you can buy extra tickets. So like you can bring a friend or two but you'd have to pay for their tickets, yeah. which is very fair. You yeah, know, yeah. It includes the final four, everything, you know? Yeah. So we all go, we all show up. I mean, we had, God, for the 16 final four, there must have been 100 alumni there, you know? And and I think on the 85 team, I think 90% of the team was there, and we were all sitting together watching them, watching Chris make that shot at the end, you know? And uh, Dwayne McClain, who had a, has a replaced hip, jumped over the table like the Dwayne McClain of old was <laughs> on the court before the confetti hit the ground. You know? <laughs> so it was uh it was a lot of fun for all of us, you know. So it's been great with Jay and and now Kyle too. Yeah. Kyle, we we all if you asked any of the alums, hey who you, you know, you're going to lose Jay, who do you want? Everybody would have said Kyle Neptune to a man. Everybody would have said Kyle because that's the kind of guy he is. Uh he was there and, and helped build the culture there. Um He's done a good job of keeping that up. Well, we took some lumps this year, yeah. some bruises, as as is expected. I mean, you know, come on, you can't you can't go through what they went through and expect. Uh, you know, people have very high expectations now because of we've won over the last bunch of years. Um, but we'll get back to our winning ways. I'm I'm very confident in Kyle, and you know, he's only been a head coach for a year. This is only his second second year, year yeah, coach, and uh, he's going to be fine. And and the part about it is. Again, you know, he's he is all about the alumni, the basketball alumni. He appreciates everybody coming back and participating in the program and talking to the kids on the current team and just the way Jay did, exactly the same way. You know, so I think I think we're gonna be fine. Everybody in Nova Nation should chill. <laughs> give <them a> break. <laughs> you know, give them yeah. a break. You know, they wanted to run Jay out of town too. I remember in two thousand fifteen and look what happened. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I would uh, give Kyle a break. He's going to be fine. We're going to be fine. Uh, and we're going to go back to uh, the way it was, winning games again, I'm sure. You know, it's just a matter of time. Chuck, dude, I cannot thank you enough for this opportunity. And by the way, thank you so much for keeping the fire burning and for being, you know, a connective tissue to this, to people like me, to that 85 team, because um, it's such an important group of guys and the school and the program is just so important. Um, so I appreciate your availability and taking the time to do this. Absolutely. Anytime, buddy. You yeah. Know that. This has been a Rogue Media Podcast.